This is Wednesday, June 5th. There are 42 days until San Diego Comic-Con 2019. Welcome to SD Concast, the official podcast of the San Diego Comic-Con unofficial blog. B-A-N-U-H-T-W-E, go. Oh my God, I love Live Journal and my Live Journal loves me. Current food is hyper and current news on Reptile 73. I love the color scheme in pink and purple. Good evening. I'm your host, James Riley, and joining me on the podcast tonight, as always, Carrie Dixon. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And also, Andy Wagner. Hey, guys. How's everybody doing? And our special guest this evening, Jackie Estrada. Hello. All right. So we're going to take your comments and questions during the show. You can tweet us at SD underscore comic underscore con or use the hashtag SD concast. We'll also be keeping an eye on the YouTube live chat if you wish to comment there. Um, let's just get right into it. Uh, Jackie, so you are one of five individuals who have attended San Diego Comic-Con every year since its inception. Uh, with this being the 50th year, what does that mean to you? Uh, that I'm still here and alive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think it's pretty good that's something that was in 1970 that only had 300 people at it. That there were quite a few people still around who were at that first one. Um, yeah, there's just a handful of us that have been to all of them, but there are some people who've been to like 47, 48 out of them. So that's pretty good too. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any memories of what that first year was like? The back then? Well, I just went for one day. I didn't go for all three days, but I went there on the Saturday, and I did get to see uh, Jack Kirby be interviewed. I got to see Ray Bradbury be interviewed. Um, I saw the art show, which was basically editorial cartoons from the San Diego uh, Union Tribune. Well, it was the Evening Tribune then, uh, newspaper. That was the big display, and then I made my pass through the dealer's room, and check things out there and uh, it was uh, very exciting to have something like that in San Diego because um, having been a fan in the 60s and subscribed to all the fanzines uh, mostly you did things mail order you sent off uh, to ads that were in the, the fanzines to order uh, the comics that you wanted uh, there were some comic shops in downtown San Diego that I went to regularly. Um, they were not supposed to be comic shops, but they were places like Ye Old Magazine Shoppy, which had the comic section. There was Lanning's Bookstore, which had old comics that you could buy. And then um, my husband at the time, Davy Estrada, and I would drive up to L.A. and go to Hollywood Boulevard and go to... Um, places there to buy comics, including Cherokee Bookstore, which was very famous at that point for having uh, Burt Bloom and his back issues at comics. So to be able to go to one place that had all this stuff and see Ray Bradbury and see Jack Kirby, I mean, what more could you want? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's amazing. That sounds absolutely amazing. I, I can't even imagine what that would have been like back in the day. When was that first moment when you had, that, I guess, that aha moment that you looked at San Diego Comic-Con and realized this is really something special? I would have to say uh, the 1974 con, because that was the one that had Charles Schultz and Frank Capra at it. Uh, Wow. You know, top directors of all time, one of the top comics create comic strip creators of all time, and you still had Ray Bradbury and you still had Jack Kirby there. I mean, it was just uh, enough that you could just walk up to those people and have conversations with them. I, I interviewed Frank Capra. I have pictures I took of him there. Um, so that to me was okay, this is not just a little local event, you know, this is, this is getting national here. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting seeing the seeds of, of what 
Comic-Con would become today, you know, having uh, essentially all aspects of pop culture, you know, that early at the show. Um, how has it been watching? Well, that was, Go ahead. Well, um, to me, it's just evolved that it's, it's a whole bunch of shows going on at the same time. So people can come for their one thing that they're really interested in, whether it's gaming or manga and anime or uh, original artwork or Star Wars or whatever it is. But the cool thing is they come for that, but then they're exposed to all of these other things. And then they discover other things that they're excited about and interested in. And so, you know, if you walk through the exhibit hall to get to um, buy that toy you wanted to buy and then, oh, wait, what's that over there? Well, that looks interesting. And then suddenly, you know, you're, you're buying uh, a, a independent comic that some person has labored over. So uh, it's just, it's a whole bunch of different shows under one big tent. Absolutely. And we even have had people, you know, even yesterday during the, the Bud Plan interview where the, they're talking about how they actually started collecting comics because of going to Comic Con for the movies and TV shows. So sure. it's always nice to well, see. Well, you that. know, even even like uh, we are, there was already TV movie stuff involved in the very beginning. The the first logo of Comic Con was the, it was called the Golden State Comic Con, and there was uh, the state of California, and it had three. Uh, yeah. circled on it. One said comics, one said science fiction and fantasy, and one said, said, you know, movies and TV. So those were, it wasn't just uh, comics and that's it. And people who are interested in one field tend to have interest in the other ones too. So we're, we're all collectors, fans of various kinds of things. Right. And now, even though it's been there since the beginning, how has it been watching the event transform from those early years to what it is today, which has basically just increased the size and scope? Um, what would you say has been the biggest shift or change that you've seen? Well, the what happened that was major that I think um, two things happened. One is that it went from being a volunteer organization that put it on to going more professional and having an office and paid employees. And that happened in the mid-1980s. And then the degree of professionalism also went up in the publishers and exhibitors and things like that. So when Comic-Con went from the 1980s, where it was in the Convention and Performing Arts Center and moved to the Convention Center, Suddenly, you were seeing professional exhibitor booths, <clears throat> like the DC booth, with suddenly this big giant thing with, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, professional production to it, and not just a table with people sitting behind it and in boxes of stuff for sale. And so that changed the press coverage that Comic Con got. I was in charge of PR back in the late 70s and trying to get the reporters to not make the focus be, oh, look at how much these comics are worth that your mother threw away. You know, trying to steer them toward, look who we have as guests and, and look at the programs that are going on and all these things. Finally, when there were these exhibits that were just... Uh, like any other major convention in other fields at a convention center, then that was a place where they would set up the microphones and be in front of it and start talking about other aspects of the show. So I think those were turning points that uh, just made it go toward what I call professionalism versus, you know, volunteer amateurism type stuff. And uh, it just, you know, each year became more and more uh, a professionally run event. And, and it attracted 
not only people from across the country, but from around the world. In 1980, we had a, a group that came from Japan with Tezuka and uh, Monkey Punch and other major manga and anime creators. Uh, and they went back and said, hey, the San Diego place is pretty cool. And you know, Mobius came from France, and we had people... But that's why it's Comic Con International because people come from all over. That's just, it's just awesome to hear all of that, all the stuff that's happened in the past keeps going. So I want to shift gears just a little bit here, Jackie, and let's let's talk about you. So, just for anybody who doesn't know, Jackie is also the administrator of Nurse, but you've done a bunch of other stuff. But let's talk about you were a volunteer. And how did you first get involved as being a volunteer at Comic-Con? Well, I was uh, a freelance writer. Uh, I, I have a journalism degree from San Diego State that I got in 1968. While I was at school, I majored in magazine article writing as a subcategory of journalism. And so even though my day job, I was editing college textbooks, I was writing magazine articles for a lot of different places on a lot of different topics. And once that 1974 show happened with those people at it, you know, I said, you know, this should be talked about in a major publication. So I sent a query letter to Rolling Stone and I said, how about, you know, an article about this convention in San Diego that brings together all these people from comics and film and animation and science fiction and, and the editor that I corresponded with said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Go ahead, you know, and uh, do the article. So to do that, I had to attend some planning meetings. And uh, so I went to where, you know, the Sheldorf and, and uh, Richard Butner and, and the whole, all the different heads of departments would sit and plan the convention for the next year and they're going well yeah Jackie it's nice you're going to write about us but since that's what you do for a living could you do like some PR for us <laughs> that's, that's kind of how I got sucked in and then I ended up editing publications uh, in 77 and 78 and also in the 80s and I was official photographer from about 78 to 82, um, I ran Artist Alley. I set up the pro registration. I was involved in a lot of different aspects of the con over the years before I ended up handling the Eisner Awards. So out of all those, have there been a favorite of those many different hats that you've worn? Could you repeat the question? Do you, of all those different things that you've done with Comic Con National, do you have a favorite? Well, you know, I've been doing that year awards for 29 years now, so that's my focus. I love doing publications. I was, it allowed me to interact with a lot of uh, uh, creators to get them to do covers for the book, um, to do artwork submitted for the gallery sections and also uh, for a couple of years I was involved with guests so I would be getting, you know, phone calls from uh, uh, Daffy Duck on the phone <laughs> 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 and from Buster Crab and different people like that. So that, you know, uh, Bob Keen, um, various other people that we invited to be guests. Since there was no office or staff or anything, my phone number is what people had. So they, you know, they would give out my phone numbers if you have questions about being, um, getting there, et cetera, et cetera, call Jackie. So um, I enjoyed really that one-on-one -on -one basis with people from, you know, Robert Heinlein to um, Carl Barks. Uh, it was that was just amazing to be able to do that. Uh, I, I can't even imagine what some of your answering machine messages would have been like. I don't think we had answering machines. 
Hey, notice I didn't say voicemail. But I did. I was a freelance person, so I was home during the day, and so I was the one people could reach and talk to because, for instance, the person in charge of the dealer's room worked full-time during the day, so he could only be really reached after, you know, 7 o'clock San Diego time, uh, so if somebody's on the East Coast, 10 o'clock their time, and <clears throat> so, oh, we'll just call Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you had mentioned the uh, Eisner Awards. Now, you've been involved with that since, since inception back in 98, is that correct? No, no. The, the Eisner Awards were taken over by Comic-Con in 1990, and that's when I started doing them. But they existed for a couple years before that. Um, basically, the history is that first there was the Kirby Awards, and those were done by Santa Graphics, and uh, Dave Aldrich, who worked at Santa Graphics, was the administrator. So they gave out the Kirby Awards at Comic-Con as a program, and then uh, Dave left Santa Graphics, and so there was some kind of discussion, well, who's going to get the, the Kirby Awards in, because Dave wanted to still administer them, but Santa Graphics wanted to keep them. So it ended up that um, there were no more Kirby Awards because Fanographics started the, Kurtz, the Harvey Awards for, with Harvey Kurtzman's approval. And then uh, Dave Ulbrich went to Will Eisner, set up a nonprofit that was the Eisner Awards, and those were given out in 88 and 89 at Comic-Con. And then it just got to be... Uh, you know, a labor of love for Dave, but he couldn't keep doing it. He knew San Diego was a nonprofit. Um, so Will Eisner and, and Dennis Kitchen came to Comic Con and said, Would you guys want to take over the Eisner Awards? And uh, and Will had requested me as a possible administrator because he was one of those people that, as someone who dealt with guests, I had been uh, working with him on uh, guest arrangements and also contributing things to the publications. And so that all happened in 1990. And been going strong ever since. Yep. <laughs> so in, in all the years of attending uh, Comic-Con, both as an attendee and then later uh, as a volunteer and then running the Eisners, is there something that you're proudest of or a favorite memory? Uh, there's too many. <laughs> uh, all you have to do is say certain names of people and it presses a button and I can tell a story about them but uh, I would be going back to Ray Bradbury I think he is probably the most inspirational speaker I ever heard anytime, anywhere anytime he talked I would drop everything that I was doing and go to that panel or program uh, because he was just such an optimistic person, and uh, his love for comics and science fiction and all things um, fantasy, you knew no bounds, and he didn't have any trouble talking about how much as a kid he read Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, and those inspired him, and then, you know, he we talk about looking to the stars and that's our future. And, you know, it was just so inspirational that, uh, you know, I always think of, of seeing him as a real highlight of the years. Yeah. I'm, I'm sad you know, that I, I never got to, I don't, got to uh, meet Bradbury, even though I've been to 25 comic cons. Well, he, he did a, uh, I think the last, panel he did was with Ray Harryhausen and uh, Julia Schwartz, who they were lifelong friends, the three of them, and and uh, Bradbury was in a wheelchair at the time, and it was just, uh, it was magical, too. I bet. I, I believe that. Uh, from what I understand, you actually met your late husband, the cartoonist Batten Lash, through Comic Con somehow. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, um, 
It was 1990, and <clears throat> I had edited the souvenir book that year. And one of the themes in it was a tribute to the spirit. It was the 50th anniversary of the spirit by Will Eisner. And I got that sent off to the printer in June. And Faye Desmond, who's executive director of Comic-Con, said she was going to be going to the Chicago Con for the 4th of July weekend. And she's going to not be in the capacity of representing Comic-Con, but she was going to be helping Bob Chapman at the graffiti booth sell t-shirts. And I said, can I just go along with you? And she said, sure. So I just kind of, uh, as a whim, uh, went with her to the Chicago Comic Con. So uh, one of the first nights of the convention, I think it was DC, had a, a party. And um, so I was sitting at a table talking to some people, and this guy came and tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, are you Jackie Estrada? And I said, yes. He said, oh. My name's Staten Lash, and I just want to thank you for using my my Bleisner Spirit pinup in this year's souvenir book, and and actually sending me a postcard and telling me I was going to be in there. I really appreciate that. And so that's when I met him. And then over the course of the weekend, Faye and I kept running into that with his best friend Russell Calabrese, and they were both there from New York. Uh, they had been to San Diego the previous year uh, in 89 and uh, said, oh, we already have plans to go to San Diego again this year because we just loved it so much. And I said, oh, you're coming to San Diego. Oh, well, uh, since you're doing that, um, let's see. Uh, let me give you a call. Uh, and I found excuses to uh, to call him a few times before he came out to San Diego that August. and. One of them being, since you're in New York, there's this chocolatier there, Toyser Chocolatier, and they have this one kind of truffle that you can't get anywhere else. So could you, I'll pay you if you just go and pick that up for me and bring it to San Diego. And, and he and his friends were all coming early uh, on Sunday of the week. So uh, that was a good excuse for a bunch of us all to go to dinner together. And people were, it was kind of obvious I was interested in him. So they would like rearrange the chairs so that he would be sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by, by the end of the week, we were an item. So that's, awesome. that's, that's how Comic Con brought us together. It was really Will Eisner, too, that brought us together because Will Eisner was his teacher at the School of Visual Arts. So, oh, wow. Well, then it all just came full circle, didn't it? Yep. Exactly. That's awesome. So, um, you also have two books of photographs taken at Comic Con that have been published uh, throughout the seventies. I think through the nineties. How did those books come about? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I was a personal photographer from the late seventies to the early eighties for Comic Con. And I had been taking pictures from about 1974 on anyway, because as a journalism major in college, I had uh, learned not only photography, but I had a dark room um, that I rented, and I developed my own film and made my own prints and everything. And uh, I also did photography of the local punk music scene at that same period. And so I just kept on taking pictures on throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then a, a few years ago, somebody approached me and said, um, we're trying to do a website where we're going to put as many like photos of various conventions and things up there and, and uh, you are willing to have like a space on there to put all your photos on. And I said, well, that sounds interesting, but my photos are just all over the place. I've just, I've got negatives. Well, we'll scan all your negatives for free at high res. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I scrounged up as many negatives as I had, which was like 3,000 of them, I think. And they, they scanned them in. And then I started looking through everything. And I said, oh, well, I have to do a book now. 
So I did my first book, which was um, Comic Book People, photographs from the 70s and 80s. And uh, most of the photos are from the San Diego Con, but there's some that are from, uh, for instance, science fiction conventions that mm-hmm. I went to. And then that people really like having those books. It's not just photos, it's, it's kind of my anecdotes about the people that are in the photos and uh, memories and things like that. So it's not a reference, it's more like a yearbook type thing. So then I said, well, let's do the 90s because I have a ton of photos from men, too. And the 90s were very interesting because that's when the whole self-publishing movement and independent publishers and everything happened. And uh, so uh, Batten and I went to a lot of other places because we had started our own publishing company, Exhibit A Press, to publish his comics and graphic novels. Um, Supernatural Law and Wolfenberg Counselors in the Club. So we had booths at things like the Small Press Expo, Alternative Press Expo, Chicago Comic Con, Heroes Con, things like that. So at those events, I took photos too. So um, the 90s book has got pictures from uh, a lot of other things besides San Diego. But uh, yeah, they're kind of hardcover, coffee table type books with uh, pictures of um, Joe Schuster and and Jerry Siegel and C.C. Beck and a lot of, you know, gold and silver age people in there, Um, animators like Chuck Jones and Bob Clampett and uh, science fiction authors Robert Honeywine, Peter Sturgeon, uh, a lot of people who aren't with us anymore, but uh, we're just part of the scene back then. So it's kind of a trip down memory lane, I guess you'd say. Do you think we'll get a 2000s book? (laughs) Well, I stopped using um, a camera with film in the early 2000s and went to point and shoot because I just had so many other things I was doing, photography had to go to the bottom of the list. Plus, I had so many things to do at Comic-Con, I, I stopped having time to take pictures anymore. <laughs> so, all my things just made it away from the, from the last party on the last night. Then I started taking pictures. That's funny. So, in obviously, you've attended for five decades. Like, you have so many memories spread out over the years. And you've met so many amazing people. You've mentioned several of them tonight. But are there any that really stick out in your memory as far as favorite people you've gotten to meet over the years through Comic Con? I would immediately pops into my mind is the Kleban, the guy who did the cats. That was that was a huge fad for a long time of his striped cats and cats and never cats calendars and sheets and, you know, all kinds of uh, t-shirts and things, but uh, he was a cartoonist who had originally been in Playboy, and he did very absurd type cartoons, and there are several collections of his uh, wacky type stuff that he did, but he was just a unique personality. Uh, one of the most interesting people I've ever met and just so enjoyable to sit and chat with. And uh, one of the things that I liked about him was that every time somebody asked him a question and it was always the same kind of question, he would give a completely different answer. So didn't, he didn't have pat answers to, how did you come up with this idea? <laughs> he always did something you, you know, he got tired of saying the same things, but here's a typical example. Uh, we used to have a breakfast where you could sign up to sit at the table of one of the guests. So there would be like two guests at the table and then eight fans. So I was at a breakfast. That I was at the table with him, and one of the women said, uh, could you draw a picture for my sister. She just loves cats. And if you could draw a picture for her, and he said, oh, sure. And she said, but it's got to be Siamese because she loves Siamese cats. And he says, I don't draw Siamese cats. I only draw stripy cats. 
Oh, but please, 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 oh, please, can you draw a Siamese? Yes. And he goes, okay. So you see him drawing. He finally tears a piece of paper off the pad and hands it to her, and it's two striped cats joined together at the middle. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's so, what you get when you don't specify. Yeah, so they were Siamese they were cats. They were Siamese twins. That's <laughs> anyway, I think that, that, that's one of my, my favorites. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's just, like you say, five decades. There, There's a lot, a lot of stuff to uh, pop into the brain. With various cues. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I, I believe that definitely. Now you've been coming to Comic Con, obviously, for five decades. A lot of people come back to San Diego every single year. What is that one thing that every time Comic Con happens, you say to yourself, "Oh, I have to do this." You know, what restaurant you go to, uh, one person you have to meet with, something like that. Uh, well, since I live here, um, I have, you know, access to all of the regular stuff. I mean, I just have traditions of people that, you know, my Tuesday night dinners with so-and-so, my Wednesday night dinners with so-and-so, that type of thing. So um, there are people that, I think you probably had this experience that even though you haven't seen them for a year, it's like you're just picking up the conversation again. Yeah. From from you know, it, it's like you just saw them yesterday. You just you you're back, you know, best pals, even though you haven't even had any contact. So, I think those kinds of interesting friendships, um, and it's uh harder maybe these days to do that because even though someone you expect to see there over four days, you never run into them. It's like yeah. you were there, I was there, we never saw each other. So you have to make a point of, okay, I'm going to make sure I see that person. Uh, but um, it's just uh, I, don't, I can't think of any Specifically, there were a few years there where I felt like the one thing I had to do was on Sunday afternoon go to Buffy the Musical because that closes out the con every year. So that was um, just my personal thing to go do by myself, go sing along with Buffy the Musical. But uh, the last couple of years, I had to be at the booth and, and wasn't able to leave. So that kind of by the wayside. But uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of my must-do thing. The only other that I always make a point of doing is I go in the exhibit hall to the section that has um, all of the publishers who do a lot of graphic novels, whether it's, you know, Fanagraphics and... Uh, uh, Drawn a quarterly and people like that, and 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 that's my little buying spree where I pick up a bunch of books. And if if somebody's there who's uh, one of their creators, and I can get a signature, then great. If I can get a Linda Berry signature or Carol Tyler or um, Robert Williams or whatever, you know, that's icing on the cake. Absolutely. Do you, Jackie, do you mind answering a quick reader question? Uh, sure. Okay. Twitter at Lister Snag in our chat wanted to know, with so many great comics out there, what what do you look for when you start looking for an Eisner Awards winner? Well, I don't do any of that. I'm just <laughs> the administrator. So we have judges that are the ones who who uh, are the ones who choose the uh, nominees in all the categories, and and they have their everybody has their own criteria of what you know makes a good graphic novel or um, book about comics or whatever the category happens to be. Uh, but the main criteria is you know just 
kind of going to stand the test of time. It's this just, you know, so excellent that uh, 10 years from now, somebody's going to pick it up and say, wow, this is such, you know, this is a really good book, or they can look at it. Oh, that's, that's so 2019. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. All right. Well, I think that does it for our reader questions. Thank you so much for joining us, Jackie. We greatly appreciated that. Uh, actually, hold on. We've got one more question. J.R. Winslow asked, what advice would you give to someone going to Comic-Con for the first time? Uh, my advice is to come up with the five things or that are the main things you want to do no matter what. And and everything else is gravy. As long as you reach those goals that you pick that you for sure want to do, then, you know, the rest of the time you're just... I think one of the things that I hear from a lot of people is they just have experiences that are totally unplanned where they just happen upon something or run into someone and uh, that makes the whole convention for them. But if you try to plan every hour and every second, then you're going to be disappointed because, oh, I didn't get to do this and I didn't get to do that. So so just have, have goals and uh, be happy that those get it. You know, the minimum ones get accomplished and everything else will be icing on the cake. That's actually pretty much exactly what I tell people as well when they ask me that question. So that's funny. Uh, well, again, thank you so much, Jackie, for joining us. Uh, is there anywhere on the Internet that people can find you? Well, for my books, it's uh, exhibitachris.com. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, again, thank you so much, Jackie. We had a great time talking to you. So I'm going to let you go, and we're going to carry on with the news. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. All right. So now it's time to get into news. Yes. And... There's a bit of it from the last week. Uh, uh, a little bit. What? <laughs> Nothing happened today, though. What are you talking about? Nothing at all. So let's just kick it off with the thing that happened just a few hours ago, and that was the uh, breaking news from, I think it was IGN. IGN first reported, Warner Brothers is foregoing any sort of Hall H presence. What? Oh, no. It was basically the reaction of anybody. And of course, you know, they softened the blow with just a teeny bit <laughs> by releasing the first Wonder Woman 1984 poster. But the fact that we're not going to get any comic movies or Godzilla movies or anything in Hall H for Warner Brothers on Saturday morning is just astounding. I mean, it is astounding. Well, I think I think the thing that's most astounding about this is normally when a studio doesn't go, it's because they just don't have that much on their slate that makes sense for the convention. And that is absolutely not the case with Warner Brothers. Like they have they, they've <laughs> like got the said, Snyder I mean, got, cut. Oh my oh, god. Come no, on. They, no, we're not we're not doing that. <laughs> they've got they Birds have. of Prey, they've got Joker, like you said, they've got Godzilla, like they've got a ton of stuff that they could have brought. And so the fact that they're not coming is just really it's interesting. It, it's mind boggling that because they haven't been, we checked, and it looks like they haven't been since twenty they've been at every con in Hall H on Saturday morning since twenty eleven. Well, twenty eleven was last year they skipped, basically. Yes, so they've that's gone what you're trying to say. Eight, six years in a row, which no other studio has like has that kind of track record. Like no other studio has that kind of track record at Comic Con. Uh, one, every other year, maybe. Yeah, one thing I do want to clarify real quick, though, because I had a ton of people ask me this earlier. Uh, that they we're only talking about the movies, like the WB TV shows, not included at all in this. That's a totally separate division. Won't be affected by this decision. So they don't worry about. Yeah, they, they they have to make their own decision whether they're coming or going. It's not included in this. 
I, I mean, we've pretty much already said that Supergirl's going, so like they, they'll be there. Don't worry about the TVs, is my point. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is really surprising. I would, however, like to point out that I have been saying this entire time, even though it's the 50th anniversary, and I'm sure there's going to be some amazing stuff there this year, like Comic-Con International cannot control what the studios bring. And so... Or whether they I, I mean, even show up. Yeah, and so I'm like, this is pretty much proof positive of that. Um, <laughs> so the good news is this happens every single year. We get the, hey, I'm not going to Comic-Con stuff first. And then within a week or two, everybody's like, yeah, I'm going. It's great. So even though it sucks today, this is not, we do this every year. Like, and this is not the end of Comic-Con. It doesn't mean no movie studios at all will be there. And and James Binder brings up a good point in the chat. Is Couldn't Legendary bring Godzilla versus Kong or whatever it's called. Um, technically, they could because Legendary has had their own panels in the past. But not but, for many years. Not for but, many, many yeah, years. Yeah, they haven't done anything. <laughs> so they could. Many years. Not likely, not likely at all. Uh, what I do think is likely, I mean, I feel as though we've gotten so many hints at this point that Marvel is going that I, I will be... Not quite as shocked as I am today about Warner Brothers, but just about if Marvel doesn't show. Uh, and I, I'm hopeful that Sony and Paramount will show up too because I feel like they have a ton of stuff on their slates as well. I feel like Sony, maybe even more so, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see. But again, this is not like the end of Comic Con. People skip every year. Like it, it's just whatever makes sense for the studios at that point in time. So. This is just, it feels like bigger news because Warner Brothers goes virtually every year. <laughs> and this is what happens. This is how, what happens every year is we get the early announcement of someone not going. And then yeah. all of a yeah. sudden, like every week after that, it's like, this is going and here's going and this is coming. And you no, know, everyone's like sad, like they were last year when Game of Thrones, HBO didn't come. Yeah. But there was stuff to fill the gap and we still yeah. had a lot of fun anyway. Yeah, give it, seriously, give it, like, two weeks, and, like, every day we'll be, like, here's ten panels that are going. So, like, don't worry, guys. Don't worry. Stuff's honestly, still going. And honestly, if you've been holding out for that downtown hotel, now might be the time to check. Yeah, I mean, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, I'm, like, I always think that's so silly when people cancel over, like, one thing. Like, you've worked this oh, hard yeah. to go to the convention, like, go, you will find something else. And we should clarify, so Warner Brothers is not going to hold a Hall H panel, but that does not mean that they will not be the convention at all. First of all, we know for sure they have a booth. We know for sure that it's split with DC. Uh, we know for sure that they are doing Scare Diego on Wednesday night, which we have not talked about, but we're going to do right now, <laughs> uh, which is basically their annual, I mean, it's kind of off-site panel thing uh, that you have to go get a ticket for up in sales the Wednesday of preview night. Uh, last year you did have to have a preview night badge, which makes no sense to me, but whatever. <laughs> uh, but we know that they're going to bring it for that. Uh, we know that they're going to bring the director and some cast. They might have some other stuff there. I still feel like Dr. Sleep might get some footage shown there. Uh, they will probably do off-sites. I'm sure they'll do a couple of signings. Now, it may not be like the whole cast for their movies, but we might get one or two cast members from various things. So this does not mean that Warner Brothers will have no presence whatsoever at the convention. It just means they will not be on the Hall H stage. For studio movies. For studio movies, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure Supernatural will still be in there on Sunday. So. And, and possibly HBO because of the Watchmen show or whatever else they want to bring. Yeah. HBO yeah. stuff done by Warner Brothers could yeah. still be. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Mike Nelson asked, does the WB announcement affect Watchmen on HBO? Again, so truthfully, HBO brings their own stuff. Even though like HBO is part of Warner Brothers, HBO does their own panels. Like They don't it's barely even like part of Warner Brothers announcements uh, but movies and TVs are two very different departments so one be one skipping does not mean the other as Karen session just said uh, Marvel has skipped years in the past but agents of shield has still gone so one does not affect the other so don't worry about your TV shows unless they're mid-season <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> then they're that. not going. Then they're not going. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. Do we have any other questions about any of this? Let's see here. Uh, as and as several people have also said, uh, and I even said today, the very silver lining of this is last year when some very big things skipped, like Game of Thrones and Marvel skipped the lines were amazing <laughs> yeah so honestly nothing all of these things could skip <laughs> but i'd be happy <laughs> all right uh let's move on yes yes sure. okay uh parking uh, is still open for group four which is the last group it'll open to everyone on monday so if you did not if you were an unlucky winner in the lottery or if you just forgot to sign up monday's your day all righty and moving on from that uh i don't know if you guys saw but kevin smith is having a huge huge contest for the uh, IMDb boat access. Uh, you can win a pair of four day badges to Comic-Con. They include the flight and airfare. You get to attend an invitation only VIP IMDb boat party as Kevin Smith's guest. You get to interview Kevin Smith and take photos with him on board the boat. And you get an autographed Kevin Smith jersey, which from what I hear, he's not wearing anymore because of all of his weight loss. Uh, but that's being held over at Omaze. Uh, we've got a link to that in our uh, post about it. And uh, you you would have to either donate or there is a uh, free method of entry that they kind of sneak in at the bottom, but it is there and you can do it. All right. Uh, real quick, I'm going to answer a couple quick questions in the chat. So Sir Lister Smeck asks, when do you think we'll get an announcement on how the exclusives lottery portal will work? It opened on June 27th last year. I'd expect similar timing. Uh, Fire Fairy 1212 asks, what time did Scare Diego start last year? 9.30 p.m. is your answer. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, I'm in like full combo tonight, apparently. All right. <laughs> like, when, when you wake up, this. you wake up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got the trolleys have started to get their annual wraps, and the first one is actually has hit the tracks as of yesterday. Was that only yesterday? Dear God. Uh, uh, the first one is for SpongeBob. <laughs> And the cool thing this year is there are actually going to be 50 wraps, which is nice because it's the 50th anniversary for Comic-Con. Uh, I would expect to see some similar wraps for things that we got last year, like Sci-Fi had a bunch of wraps last year, Fox Animation had a bunch of wraps last year. So I'm sure there are plenty more to come, and I'm sure there'll be some fun surprises. Yeah, I remember Sci-Fi did the uh, "It's a Fan" thing last year, where they had all the fan art around the trolleys. That was that was amazing. It was amazing. See, it was see people's art like bigger than life on a trolley. That that was that was amazing for them. Uh, yeah, and the thing that I actually loved the most about that was that they displayed the artist name so prominently. You know, yeah. that it truly was like this is fan art. Like here's the fan artist, which quite frankly, a lot of times doesn't happen. So that was really nice to see. It was definitely. I, I completely agree. And, yeah. and as J.R. Wenzel said, Sci Fi actually made shirts of that art at New York Comic Con. Yes, they did. And I'm a little jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, me. Yeah. yeah, I guess I'd want one too. So, moving on from that, I don't know if anybody is old enough to remember the original Ripley's Believe It or Not with Jack Palance. I grew up on it. It was one of my favorite shows. They brought it back in, I think, the mid to late 90s with Dean Kane. But now they're bringing it back again on the Travel Channel with uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not with uh, Bruce Campbell as the host. Uh, we just found out that they are coming to Comic-Con in July with a panel. Uh, this is to celebrate 100 years of Ripley's Believe It or Not. They're going to do a little 10 episode series it's gonna actually start on june 9th and if you've ever been to any bruce campbell panel if you've seen him walking the halls if if you're anywhere within earshot you know that his panels are some of the most entertaining panels in comic con 
Um, I would recommend not taking the kids to those uh, because he can get a little blue, but uh, Bruce is one of those amazing panelists that you just can't help but be entertained by. Um, uh, looks like uh, Campbell was talking to Monsters and Critics and he said that uh, he's gonna try to drag some people out to conventions and uh, he said, yeah, let's go to Comic-Con. So they're coming to Comic-Con and they're gonna have a panel and it's gonna be sometime Saturday. So that's gonna be clearing my schedule on Saturday. Yeah. And another contest that was announced is CBS uh, is sending uh, one of their current all access subscribers, uh, giving them a chance to win a trip to San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, airfare, five night stay at a hotel, transportation from the airport to your hotel, as well as from the hotel to the convention center, a pair of badges, and 500 bucks. Uh, that's pretty awesome. So uh, if you want to find out how to enter that, uh, head on over to our site, and the link is right there on the site. The, old, the biggest catch on that one is you have to be a CBS All Access member prior to May 31st. So you can't just, if you're not a member right now, you can't sign up and enter the contest. So. I think that was just a little bit kind of sneaky, but hey, oh well. you gotta do what you gotta do. Limit, exactly. limit the entry Get it for the people who actually wanted it, not just the contest, right? But think of how many people would sign up for that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they they paid the sign up just for the, uh, the free month or whatever they offer and then cancel oh, yeah. without having to, to pay anyone. <laughs> so it's the way to do it. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, Alejandro Hurtado asked, when do D23 Mixer tickets normally go on sale? Sometime soon. They, I don't think they really have a set date. We just, it's just soon. Uh, it was July 6th last year. I did look it up while you so, guys were talking. Very close to the time. <laughs> don't look now, look in about a month. But keep an eye out for it. We will announce when we see uh, that they have put up that they're going to go on sale. Because I think D23 typically announces their tickets a couple of days before they actually go uh, on sale. Yeah. They put the post up for, hey, these are coming, and then they go, and then they're gone. Yeah. I think they're going to go really fast this year, though, with a big Marvel. Okay. Uh, I don't and know why you put that comment there. I'm going to answer this one instead. So Lister <laughs> asked, uh, Ash, will Evil Dead be there? I'm, yeah. Ash versus Evil Dead, what, that canceled? That was canceled. <laughs> so, oh, no, no, it will not be there. Uh, James asked, any word of a Mondo party like last year? I have not heard for sure. We have Brock uh, from, Mondo. from Mondo on at some point this month. I've lost all track of time. Uh, but if it hadn't been announced by the time he's on, you can ask him then. <laughs> That's uh, my answer. Mr. Sir Lister also asked, do you have to be a paid member to buy D23 tickets? I'm pretty sure you have to be a gold member yeah. or a gold family member in order to get them. So, yes, you have to be a paid member. Yeah, you do. All right. Uh, as for off-sites, I kind of took your first one. So do you want to do mine? Uh, no, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, so we're going to move on to off-site. So one of the coolest things that happened this week is we've all been kind of quietly waiting to see what's going to happen with Conan because obviously the format of his show changed. On TV, it's no longer an hour, it's 30 minutes. So how is that going to affect Comic-Con? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then in a, the billboard the Spreckles went up and it looked like it was going to be his usual four days, which was great. But the Sparkles Billboard has been wrong in the past. <laughs> so we're all a little bit uh, nervous there. But now the dates have appeared on the One Iota site as all four dates, which means he will be there his usual Wednesday through Saturday for four tapings, provided nothing else changes. Uh, and it's usually a very good sign that tickets are soon. We're keeping an eye out. I would expect that we would get, first of all, Conan has not actually officially said that he's going to Comic-Con, so I would expect that to happen first. Uh, and then I would also probably expect the Funko Pops if they're doing those this year, and then at some point after that, we should get tickets, so. And in addition to the tickets popping, well, the, the dates popping up, um, Owen Rogers announced on Twitter that Final Space is coming back to the Team Coco house, just like last year, so that, basically confirms that Coco House is coming back. Um, they yes. have 
they've had they basically they use that for uh, comedy nights and for final space they did uh, pizza parties, table reads, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, so expect a similar things from Team Coco House this year. Yeah. Uh, truthfully, I actually think the biggest offsite news of the week is that Amazon is going to hold another humongous offsite, 60,000 square feet, which uh, I believe is the size of Jack Ryan last year, which was also massive, so they're probably utilizing that same space. But it's going to be for three of their shows, The Expanse, uh, which in the past has gotten an escape room, so it's cool that it's getting some love here with Amazon. And then the two new shows, Carnival Row, uh, which has Orlando Bloom and... Kara, not going to try to pronounce her last name. And then The Boys, which has Carl Urban. It is based on the book by Garth Ennis and Derek Robertson. So if I had to guess, it'll probably be similar to Jack Ryan last year, where they basically had like a couple of different stations or areas. Um, it should be really cool. And they're also going to have participatory theater, stage performances in tech. I'm not sure what any of that means, but they're going to have, have it. It sounds like basically what they're going to do is they're going to take all the stuff they used for Jack Ryan and do similar things, but separate them out to the different shows. So yeah, like the escape room may be Expanse again, where the VR thing may be the Cardinal Row, and then the participatory yeah. stuff may be the boys things, you know, or whatever else they may have. Um, yeah. I think they're just going to do that. They're going to use that whole space. It's, if it's the same space, it's over there on the corner on first. And it's a yep. big parking lot that they just take over the whole thing. Yep. They also said that they will be hosting screenings and parties as well. And considering that both the boys and Carnival Row and about six weeks after Comic-Con, uh, I think probably expect some pilot screenings for both of those. And then I know that Amazon did actually have a pretty cool party uh, last year at that second site, which was Amazon Fire, right? Yes, Amazon Fire. Yeah. yeah, so they did a free seven, seven or eight blocks away from the convention center. Or yeah, it was pretty far out, but they did a really cool party uh, there for free last year. Just nobody attended because no one knew it was happening. So <laughs> hopefully they announced the details a little sooner this time. Announce your parties, people. <laughs> That's right. Tell it. Tell us. We will show. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> we have we have that effect on parties. Yes. Yes, we do. All right, Andy. Yeah. You want to tell us some bad news bears? <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, one party that won't be happening is going to be Wootstock again. Um, last year, they decided to sit out Comic-Con, and this year, they're deciding the same thing. Uh, originally, it was created by Will Wheaton, Adam Savage, and Paul and Storm, uh, but unfortunately, they uh, Paul and Storm answered a uh, an enthusiastic tweet uh, asking if uh, Wootstock was dead, and while they didn't say that it was completely dead, they did just say that there will not be one at Comic-Con this year. So unfortunately, while we may see Paul and Storm there, we will not see Wootstock. I think I think it's going yeah. the way of the Princess Bride and that it's mostly dead. <laughs> yes. All right, I so, so get the airbag. Yeah. So they may breathe some life into it in the future, but I think you can basically put it on the not attending list until they decide to bring it back. Yeah, I, yeah. I think so as well. But uh, speaking of a party that is happening, the gathering at the Comic-Con Museum, uh, it is the uh, opening inaugural fundraiser at the museum. There is a, uh, you can buy tickets now, uh, not just to Comic-Con Museum members, they're available to anybody. <clears throat> and it's where they're going to inaugurate Batman and uh, there's going to be tickets that are such as the black carpet reception at 5 p.m. for $750, the main event at 7 p.m. for $250, and the after party at 9 p.m. for $50. It gets you different things uh, for what you can see and have access to. Uh, this is a 21 up an event. Uh, just head on to our website if you are interested and check out all the details. Yep. So another cool thing that's happening is the Rooftop Cinema Club is back again around Comic-Con. They've got two screenings. Uh, 
that makes sense. Technically, they've also got a Sunday night screening of La La Land, but I did not add that to the calendar, even though I love that movie. Uh, <laughs> but on Tuesday night, they've got a screening of Top Gun, and then on Wednesday, Labyrinth. And the cool thing about this is it's actually on the uh, fourth floor rooftop of the Manchester Grand Hyatt. But for as little as $17, you can go and watch an awesome movie on the rooftop. And I'm I don't have a preview night badge. I can think of way worse ways to spend your evening than watching Labyrinth on a rooftop. Seriously. Just and saying. Like Sunday night, they're going to be at our party. So. Yeah, exactly. Since we're not doing our party on Wednesday, like here's your backup. So. There you go. Yeah. Uh, for other sites, we've got, we put everything on our calendar. There's a whole bunch of other things on there, including art pop-ups, some events at Kamikaze, a Reddit party, and so much more. You can always just go look at our calendar, which has a cool layout for 2019 that hopefully makes it easier to read. Sir Lister Smeg asked, I said Conan tickets will probably go up soon. If I had to guess how soon, uh, probably a month, because I have a handy little timeline here that we made for 2018 and the Conan dates on it are June 15th. The first Conan pop was teased on July 2nd of last year. We got the Conan guess and on July 9th tickets actually went up. So by soon, I don't mean like tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> by soon, she means soon. Soon. At some point between now and July 17th. I was going to say sometime before July 17th. Always. Yes. Always. <laughs> Unless you are specific uh, vendors uh, slash exhibitors who slash Lego no. slash Lego. That wasn't good enough, but <laughs> announced the morning of Comic Con. You know, like come on, people. Oh no 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 let, let no 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 Lego announced like two hours into preview night. What what of their yeah. was? Thank you, Lego. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> All right, on to exclusive. Speaking of Lego. <laughs> Wait, no. What? What? Well, first, you... up, first up in exclusives, we have our friends at Factory Entertainment. And we have, let me see, the Griff Pitbull board bottle opener from Back to the Future. This thing is cool. Uh, it is going to retail for $19.99, limited to a thousand pieces. Um Oh, wait, sorry, it's $20, but you can also get the Marty's Hoverboard for an additional $19.99. Uh, there's also the, let me see what this is, this is called, a uh, Aquaman Ocean Silver Hero Trident Limited Edition Prop Replica. It is uh, six feet long. It's a heavy-duty replica molded out of solid metal. Yep. It looks awesome. Uh, this thing will only be available for shipping. Because they do oh, not allow can... weapons on the show Bad floor. Policy. Right. And uh, that thing is definitely a weapon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you can check them out on our site. Uh, you can also enter to win uh, one of the uh, Griff uh, boards, uh, bottle openers. And you can also pre-order everything from factory to have it shipped. And with the exception of the Trident, you can have also have it picked up at the booth. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. All right, so let's talk about NECA, who opened their pre-sale starting today. And if you missed out, they also are doing pre-sales at 10 a.m. Pacific time the next two mornings. So let's start with uh, the, they have two cool two-packs. And the weird thing is in the, if you do it in the pre-sale, you have to buy them both combined. But if you buy them at the booth, you can buy them separately. But the first one is a Batman versus Predator two-pack. And then they've also got a Superman versus Aliens two pack. So I guess you could buy both and technically have just your regular Superman versus Batman and Aliens versus Predator. <laughs> so <laughs> many combinations. So many combinations. <laughs> but uh, I mean, these are cool. These are fun. For my money, though, the best NECA exclusive was the surprise one we got today the Jabba the Hut Chia Pet. <laughs> ja, 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 ja. And can I just say, there's a guy on Twitter who every freaking time we get posted exclusive this year replies with like, nope, don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> Until this day. <laughs> he was all about this, which I think is amazing. 
I laughed pretty hard. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's a real Chia Pet and it's Jabba the Hutt. It's 45 bucks, so that's cool. Uh, for the Alien vs. Predator sets, those are, do we have a price? $60 each. Like I said, uh, if you do the pre-sale, you have to purchase them together. If not, if you wait until on site, you can purchase them separately. That's next. Right. And I don't know how you expect me to follow Chia Jabba the Hutt, but <laughs> right? I'll give it a shot. So let's see. With Monogram, I don't think it's going to be quite as cool, but it is pretty cool. Don't get me wrong. Um, it is the Alien oh. versus Predator 3D foam bag clip collector set. So you're going to have the Alien Queen. You're going to have the glow in the dark egg, which I wouldn't recommend looking directly over. And then you'll have the Elder Predator. So these will be limited to 250 pieces and will retail for $25 each. Those are much yes. cuter than the other set, at least. They are much cuter than the other set. Speaking of cute things. <laughs> Speaking of cute things, uh, my buddy Patrick Ballesteros always has cute things. And we showed off his new 25 Cent Wonder exclusive today. Uh, this one is called Little Firecrackers. It's got the Mulan gang. Uh, as with all of his exclusives, basically what will happen is closer to the con, he will release his schedule. But he does a different 25 Cent Wonder exclusive each day of the convention, uh, and they are limited to 100 pieces only, and so you just have to hurry to through if you want this on whichever day it will be released. And then Mattel had another announcement uh, today. Uh, the Macho Man Randy Savage action figure uh, themed to step into a slim gym. <laughs> oh, yeah! Yes. Uh, it will be $29.99 uh, and actually will be available through Entertainment Earth beginning on June 18th. Not part of Mattel's pre-sales, but, but you will be able to pick it up at their booth for a discounted price during the convention. So I don't, order I don't at, understand that. Earth at the convention at the Mattel booth. I, I don't understand this at all, but... <laughs> Well, it's fine. <laughs> it, it made sense to somebody somewhere. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. I will say, people seem so incredibly excited for this. So I think this one is going to do very, very well. Anyone who grew up watching those commercials is probably a little bit excited about it. Getting the yeah, slim rim. I think so. Randy, Randy Macho Man. Um, so 30 bucks is not a bad And speaking of Mattel, uh, they, they I don't remember if we mentioned this, but they're process for getting their items is the same as last year where you order the stuff online then you go check in at the booth and then they mail the stuff to you after the con yep yep and if you don't if you if you truly want to like pick it up at the con uh you just have to go buy at the booth right and hope it doesn't sell out which some yep. things have sold have sold out last year things like i think it's two or three items at least sold out at the con yeah yeah I feel like it, they had some really good stuff last year yeah, and I'm one of those guys that grew up on the old uh, classic WWE slash WWF back in the day. Uh, guys like Macho Man, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant. So I am actually considering that. <laughs> now, one of my favorite exclusives, which I also might be shooting for, is from Icon. Uh, Supergirl.tv revealed that this year's first Icon Heroes uh San Diego Comic-Con exclusive is the Dark Supergirl statue. It's going to be nine inches tall. It's going to be polystone resin. It's limited to 300 pieces. We don't know much yet about uh, pricing. We don't really have too many details on it, but if you go to our website, you can see some different poses of what she looks like. Yes, yes, indeed. <sighs> Our friends at Entertainment Earth are bringing a couple of new exclusives as well. So like James said, that Macho Man will actually be available on uh, Entertainment Earth's website starting the day after Mattel's pre-sales. But in addition to that, Entertainment Earth has a couple of Comic-Con exclusives available right now for pre-order, which you can have shipped after the convention so long as inventory remains. And those include the Glow in the Dark 
Pinky and the Brain vinyl figure, which is really cool. Uh, and then how much does that retail for? That is $49.99. And then we've also got a Deadpool Jack in the Box, which features Deadpool jumping out of a food truck, because of course he is. <laughs> that is $29.99, and it plays Pop Goes the Weasel as you literally turn the crank. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun with the exclusives this year. I, I don't know which ones I want, but I'm having fun with them. So that's what Entertainment Earth has for us so far, and they've got a whole bunch more planned. So keep an eye out. And speaking of people that have started their release, uh, Cryptozoic start announced their first uh, exclusive. We've seen some of them at WonderCon, I think, but uh -huh. this is the first one officially announced. The War Crypto. What's that? I said, I think at Toy Fair, actually. Toy Fair, okay. The War Cryptkin Series 2 vinyl figure. Uh, it will be $15 and limited to 300 pieces. And online pre-sales begin tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, so basically, they'll, they'll announce them, then they'll put them on sale, I think, each week, essentially. Whatever's yeah. available that week will be on a pre-sale. Um, yeah. And it's it's a it's a cute little uh, war horsey. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it is actually really cute. For, for, for a demonic horse, it's very adorable. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple of questions here in the chat. Sir Lister Smeg asked, if you had to guess, how many more exclusives will Mattel have? Uh, I would say At least one per property that they have, right? <laughs> I, I don't feel like they do one for every property every year. No. So no. I would expect at least five or six more typically. Yeah, I, w I would say you can expect somewhere between like five to ten more. They they did some random stuff last year. Like remember that He-Man stuff? Yeah. That Lloyd cloth. <laughs> 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 they, they had a couple of extra things for He-Man. So uh, who knows what we get this year? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Mosum2171 asked, I wonder if they will have some extra cool official Comic-Con merch considering this will be the 50th. Uh, I, you know what I would put my money on? A tiki bug. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I maintain though, for years we have said, like, if you're going to do the tiki mug, why have you not done the toucan? Like, that's literally your mascot. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally your mascot. So it's, it's my personal opinion. All right, uh, let's see here. Alejandro asked any word on Udon exclusives. Uh, I know that he has received them at his warehouse. I'm waiting for photos and all the rest. Uh, that's all I've got for you on that. And then someone said, also looking forward to news on Super 7 exclusives. So are we. Yep. 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 And there's other exclusives on the site, uh, such as uh, Symbiote announced some of theirs. Alex Ross uh, debuted one of the exclusives he'll have there. Uh, yesterday's pins has some. Uh, you can check out uh, all the exclusives on our site as they are announced. Yeah, so someone mm -hmm. asked, when will Comic-Con shirts and everything go up for sale? Let me consult my <laughs> timeline. <laughs> they consult went up the Magic last year. They went up last year on June twentieth, so I would guess similar timing. In about two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Pretty much, and most things at Comic Con happen roughly around the same time. So. From CCI Comic Con, not just yes, the from CCI. things that happen at Comic Con, but the stuff that CCI does tend to go in a similar schedule. Yes. Yes. If it ain't broke, why fix it? Right. Exactly. All right. Uh, we had a couple more questions. Dion asked, what are the chances of getting the exclusives you want through the exclusives portal? I mean, it's a lottery. So there are people last year who won three. There yeah. are people last year who won nothing. So it's just kind of whatever the lottery gods. And like don't forget with some companies, you are just getting the win to go and purchase whatever they have left. Yes. So like if Funko, if you're if you get there on one of the later days, there's a chance they may have already sold out of something. 
and yeah, or later in the afternoon. Time slots. Yeah. So, um, like when I, I I won Hasbro last year, and when I went to purchase the My Little Pony item for that for that for last year, was actually sold out for the day, so I didn't get to purchase it. So, um, not only do you have to win the lottery, but then you have to, unless it's for like Lego, which they give you specifically the thing you've won, you have just a chance to buy what's there. So. It's a lot of luck, a lot of chance, and hopefully you get what you want, or at least one thing you want. Um, so, yeah, it's a toss-up. Well, yeah. and this year for WonderCon, they had the token system where you can prioritize uh, which lottery you really want to win for which day. So I, I expect we'll see something along those lines this year at Comic-Con. Yeah, absolutely. And People won't be able to enter every single thing that's on there, all 40, 50, 80, whatever it was, uh, time slots for everything. If you're limited down to like 10 or 12 or whatever it may be, uh, or 20 for the entire show, that's fewer entries for everybody, which means hopefully the wins are going to be spread out a little more and everyone will hopefully win one thing, maybe, you know, here and there, a little bit more people winning than not winning. So, yes. We'll see how it goes. We will see how it goes. Yep. I've never won anything at a Comic Con lottery, for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Dion asks, What is the best advice for getting freebies? I'm not the one to answer this. So, one of you two want to take this? Uh, walk around a lot and see what people have on their table that is free. Yep. That's about it. There, there's a freebie table upstairs in the sales um, so people can randomly drop stuff off there. Uh, some panels, uh, the companies give away stuff for free in the panels. Uh, whenever we see something that is announced, we usually try and point it out. Um, but essentially, uh, the free stuff is whatever a company decides to bring to hand out, you have to be around to grab it when they are handing it out. Yep. Um, if there's something yep. you see someone announce that they're going to have stuff there, uh, then the best advice for getting that thing is to go up and ask at the booth how to get it. And if they say, just come back when we're giving it away, uh, then you basically have to hang around until they start giving it away or find out if there's a specific time. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so we, go ahead. Yeah, Junior Wenzel also uh, pointed out that if you donate blood, they give you a freebie kind of bag thing. Like a, a, they give you a, a shirt, price. I think. You give they give them you blood. a shirt. Yeah, you give blood, they give prize. Yes, <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right, so and we had a couple more questions about the lottery. Uh, D. Heller mentioned that some booths will open later too after their lottery people show up. That is entirely true. I think we talked about this last week. Yeah. But uh, Funko is basically the only one who, well, maybe Lego. But Funko is the only one who truly like did not allow walk-ups like do not pass go, do not collect $200. Uh, Hasbro, I think they stopped lottery sessions at like I want to say like 2 or 4 p.m. I think it was the 2 o'clock. After, after 2 o'clock you could walk up and get in line. Yeah, so after that like you could just go to the booth and purchase it wasn't a problem. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, UCC Distributing they had first of all they actually had a second booth which sold 90% of the same so it was not part of the lottery. <laughs> And then they also had a line at the lottery booth so that you could just kind of filter in. Uh, as, as, so that as one wasn't a problem. Basically. Yeah. And then Lego, uh, I think as you said on Sunday, like because they had so many people who I guess hadn't claimed in previous days that they were basically just like, what do you want? How many do you want? When I went, they were only giving you the option of purchasing one of the other Lego sets. So, like, if I won for the, uh, I think it was the Ant Man, or it was either yeah. the Ant Man or the Star Wars, because I bought both of them. So, I won for one, and then they offered me the other, the chance at the other, and that was the only one. Even though they had three sets, those were the only, they only offered me one other one as a chance to buy. Yeah. But the point being, like, if you don't win your lottery, Funko is really the only one that like your SOL. And the thing to remember about Funko as well is as long as you don't care about that sticker, 90% of those exclusives are sold through regular retail in limited quantities. So you can you just, just yeah. make your way to Hot Topic. Yeah. <laughs> if you just want the figure and you don't care about the sticker, go somewhere else. 
Yeah, go online. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Literally, like I think it's always Wednesday night at various times, like the various websites that they partner with will post them. Um, I mean, I've been in line and had my exclusives like paid for before people who had the lottery stuff. So that's what you get. Uh, Alejandro asked, any chance for a new Kermit meme exclusive this year? God, I hope so. <laughs> We pitched that last that year to UCC. I don't think that <laughs> I don't think he got it, but I was like, no. They're like, wait, this is this isn't Kermit. This is Kermit Kermit drinking tea, Kermit looking through blinds. Like, come on. Yep. It'd be fun. We can make this the yearly thing. I, I, I want the I want the uh, grouchy Kermit peering out the uh, driver's side window in traffic. That that one that one speaks to me. James, I think you usually have last year's carrot sitting right by you, don't you? Usually, but I've, I've swapped it out for um, my Star Wars Galaxy's Edge items. Fair enough. Because fair enough. Yeah, actually, he's here. You go. There's Kermit. Thank Yay. you. Hanging out off. <laughs> Very nice. All right, so I think that pretty much does it for the news. It does. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Oh. I will rub it in. Galaxy's Edge, uh, Trope Force has Galaxy's Edge tomorrow. Yes. Galaxy's Edge tomorrow. I'm going again tomorrow. <laughs> that mean Trope Force is going tomorrow as well? Uh, Dion, uh, I'm just ignoring you. Dion said, will Funimation fix their issues from last year? It was a mess getting tickets for them. Yes, it was. And I don't know. Uh, I, I've said on another so. podcast, but I think if anyone truly has a chance of joining the portal system, this year it's Funimation because what they ultimately had to do last year was basically send them up to sales for tickets, which was the system that they were trying to avoid. <laughs> so yeah, we'll see. We'll see. So uh, uh, Robert uh, says uh, that he went uh, yesterday and it was amazing. I agree. Uh, Mosum asked blue or green milk. And I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, Blue milk inside Oga's Cantina is better than blue milk outside Oga's Cantina, and outside Oga's Cantina, blue and green milk, green is better. Uh, okay. And Trope 4 says, yes, they're going 11 to 3. I will possibly see you there. I am 8 to 12. So our times will overlap. Very do, nice. not, do not go to Smuggler's Run first. Go to, if you want to do Oga's Cantina or the lightsabers, go to one of those first, uh, because the, the Smuggler's Run ride will shorten down to about a 15 to 30 minute wait after an hour or so. Nice. It's $7 more at the cantina for the blue milk. I don't care. It tastes better. <laughs> and, and it, comes with, it comes with a cookie. Come on. That's funny. So, yeah. Okay. There you go. Mix in a little right. galaxy edge in our Comic Con news. That's fine. <laughs> we will allow it. We're not jealous at all, James. No, no. Uh, in fact, one thing you can do if you want to do the lightsaber is get in line for the cantina because they do a text-based system now. Uh, go ahead and get in line for that. Get your time, and then go get in line for this lightsaber and hope that they don't overlap because you have a short amount of time to get in line for the cantina after they text you. So try that out. See if that works. Let me know how it goes. Jair Whistle just said Star Wars Talk with James. This is a new segment now, the SD Godcast. There we go. <laughs> it's the Galaxy's Edge Talk with James, <laughs> Riley. Um, oh, Dion asked another question. Uh, Dion, I'm guessing you are new going to Comic-Con because you have a lot of questions. Um, if you magically get a press pass, which it's not magic, you have to apply and you have to have all kinds of requirements. What access does it get you? Uh, nothing essentially, except for access to the press room to do your work and or interviews if people are there. And there's a press area. If you make it into Hall H, there is a press pit off to the side, but it doesn't get you any seats and it doesn't get you any access, ex you know, like early access or uh, extra access. If a room is full when you show up, they don't let you in just like anyone else. Um, the only time that press gets access that's extra is when they actually talk to the people running the panel and then they put you on a list and they let you into the room, even if the room is full, because there's a reserve section in uh, in the big rooms for people that are part of the panel or covering the panel for them and that kind of thing. So anyway, in my, in my experience, mostly what it gets you is spam emails. 
Because <laughs> uh, like uh, what they do is they put you on basically the press list, which companies may or may not use. Uh, but as we get closer, you will start getting some emails about press room invites and that kind of stuff. And there's going to be some emails you don't get and some you do. And no one understands why. Like James and I have been pressed, I think, for pretty much the same amount of time. And like we get completely different emails half the time. And we're like, yeah. okay. Whatever. So. Um, NameVac asks, so we're not having a meetup this year? We are having a meetup this year. Oh, yes, we it's are. It's just on Sunday. It's just uh, Sunday, so, Sunday, Sunday. Yeah, so we're probably making the official, official announcement tomorrow. But if you if you are a long-time uh, listener slash watcher of our podcast, you already know the details. Uh, but it will be Sunday night from, I think we determined, 6 to 8, right? 6 to 8, at least. 6 to 8, okay. Sure. 6 to 8 at uh, the Dubliner. At the Dubliner, uh, we are going to have trivia. We are going to have a coloring contest. I'm not kidding. Uh, we are basically just going to be there hanging out. So we would love to see you. We'd love to talk to you. We will be giving away some amazing things like uh, this AC candle. AC, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> 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 Patrons say to the blog, uh, so we'll be doing that. <laughs> That'll be fun. Um, we'll have shirts that we'll be giving away, we'll have buttons that we'll be giving away. It, I mean, it's a good time. Uh, my goal this year is to have a party be definitely not like the old school parties we used to throw because um, you couldn't pay me to do that again, but it will be more than it's been the last two years, three years, whatever it's been. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Let's see a question. Oh, let me ask answer a couple. Let's go back to Star Wars with James. Um, <laughs> did you see Vi Marathi? I did. I did not get a chance to talk to her, but I am planning to try and do that tomorrow because apparently it's really cool. Uh, she's the main resistance spy on Batu right now. So, and she was in one. Of, she's been mentioned, and she's actually one of the main characters in the Phasma novel. It's pretty awesome. And then um, J.R. Wenzel asked, "So is that a loaf loaf cat?" Yes, that is a Lothal cat. And if you pet it, <laughs> it actually it also purr. Oh Lord. It's James, it's you are adorable. It's it's pretty awesome. That's it's Beth's cat. I I just get to keep it back here during the podcast. That's funny. So, there you yeah, go. I like it. Yeah. All right. So I think that's all of our questions. I think so. I'm sure someone will ask one here in a minute anyway. Uh, so do you want to start wrapping us up, James? Sure. Uh, as we mentioned, there are some contests. So if you or someone you know still needs badges uh, for Comic-Con this year, all hope is not lost. Check out the contest hub. Uh, we always post any contests we see. Um, and you can just check that out. Yes, you can. Uh, I'd also just like to mention that if you are a big art person, now is definitely the time to start paying attention to Under the Tents, as lots of, lots of folks have been opening up their commission list lately. And Andy has actually been working on something super special that we should have later this week. Hopefully. Uh, I'm hoping to be done, done with it tomorrow, early okay. sometime. Um, we're compiling a list of any artists who have put out their uh, San Diego Comic Con 2019 commission info, whether they're taking orders, if they're going to have commissions at the table, anything regarding Comic Con commissions. We're compiling a list and we will put it out and update it as we get it more announcements, much like we do the contest hub. So, personally, I'd like to say if you are an artist who is opening commissions or has commissions open for San Diego uh, Comic Con, please let us know. Tweet us, email us, um, send up smoke signals, do what you have to do, but please let us know so we can get out on our list. And uh, just as a little public service announcement, uh, as someone who truly loves art, like if you have never gotten an artist to commission something for you, it it's so much cooler to have original art and it doesn't have to cost like your first child. We've got people on this commission with prices, quite frankly, as low as like $10. Uh, There's a $5 one. <laughs> okay. 
okay, I'm wrong. There's a five dollar yeah. one. <laughs> There's a five. So, it starts at five and goes up. So yeah, so so don't think that like every commission has to cost you like two to five hundred dollars. Don't think that, but truly like. like Owning original art is amazing. You get to support the artists as well. Like it, Comic Con is so much cooler. So it's my public service announcement. Absolutely, and a lot of the artists do have very specific guidelines for ordering commissions, and they really don't want anybody to deviate from them. So this list is I'm setting it up to sort of honor that and give people an easy way to find what those guidelines are, how they can follow them, and how they can get uh, that commission order. Yeah. But then on the other hand, if you're an exhibitor, not just an artist, but an exhibitor, and you want us to feature your uh, San Diego Comic-Con plans, please shoot us an email, uh, tweet at us, let us know, because we would love to drive some traffic to your table or booth or wherever you're at. Yep. Uh, and then as Jerry Winslow said, support the industry, buy from the artist, even if it's just a print. Absolutely. Like if you've Absolutely, never spent some yeah. time over an artist alley, like that's quite frankly my favorite part of the convention. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Dion asked, oh, we're going to take a quick reader question. Dion asked, any idea what goes on in the Funko Fun Days? tried for two years and I get nowhere. I mean, the problem is truly with Funko Fun Days is just supply and demand. Like there are thousands upon thousands of people trying for something like 12 to 1500 tickets and they go like that. And uh, at Comic-Con well, we are- on inside? It was on inside? No uh, a lot of no screaming. What? A lot of screaming goes on. Yes, screaming and mayhem. <laughs> Screaming and mayhem, less mayhem than it used to be. Yeah, uh, you less, you were not there for the chair dancing years. Less <laughs> less standing on chairs and throwing stuff at people, and a little bit more uh, stage showy type things and little contests on the stage. Yes, there have not been broken bones since my first year. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm aware, anyway. Darn it all! <laughs> and, I and people try hard to get to this party. Uh, yeah, very hard. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, no, but truly, like, it's not scary anymore. Uh, it's, <laughs> you get some awesome stuff. They give you some awesome food. Uh, you get some drinks. You get some entertainment. Like, it's it's truly one of the best events at Comic Con if you can get a ticket. It's just really hard to get a ticket. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you can sign up to be our attendee of the week. Uh, Kara puts up a new one every Friday. So if you have not signed up, we would love to hear all about your Comic-Con experiences. Prize Mule returns. I've got most of my sponsors now down. I'm waiting on about three more to get back to me. We will probably make an announcement on that either later this week or next week, depending on how I feel. <laughs> uh, as we already said, PCCon returns on Sunday night, which is, James, the only... The only party after Comic Con after party that is after Comic Con. Yeah. <laughs> and That's actually, right. Andy is wearing our party shirt. Talk, Andy. There you go. Hello. I am wearing the t shirt. That's pretty awesome. Love that shirt. It, it's a great shirt. Sarah, our lovely design uh, graphic artist, she made that. And we have a bunch of those to give away to you. So hopefully, you guys are excited about BasicCon. Let's and my wife actually has a matching pair of LuLaRoe leggings, so I just might wear those that day. Because by Sunday night, I am punch drunk tired, and you could pretty much get me to do anything. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. All right, James. Uh, except it's next Friday, by the way, next week. Oh, it is. Well, it then, is. on us live, when we say our next show is... But sometimes on Friday, like next week, next week, and most of the time on Wednesdays, but also possibly on other Fridays and Sundays, as in when the schedule podcast comes out. So just join us when we say. <laughs> <laughs> just don't plan anything from now until Comic Con. Just keep all we'll of your nights you, open with us. We'll give you a couple of days' notice. <laughs> Turn on your Twitter notifications. When it pops up, it pops up. 
<laughs> basically. Okay, so as so long as he does not reschedule on us again, uh, we should next Friday have the lovely Eric Goldman back, which I'm so excited to have him back because he couldn't join us last year because he had uh, corporate overlords. <laughs> but this year he can. And we will be talking about what TV shows might show up at Comic-Con. And Eric usually has a little inside info, so it should be a good talk. There you go. Um, I'm going to answer another question real quick. Uh, Do it. Ask James, one more Star Wars Galaxy's Edge question. Best drink at Ogus Cantina? I will let you know next time uh, because I've only tried three of them, I think, and I need to try more tomorrow. So, but so far, all three that I've tried have been excellent: blue milk, uh, Mugen tea, and the Yub Nub uh, in the, the Ewok Tiki glass thing. All three delicious. So, so far, so good. So all right. join us next Friday okay. for Star Wars Talk, Talk with James. <laughs> but also join us next Friday on the podcast. Yes, yes. You can also sign up for our newsletter. And oh my God, we are actually sending them weekly. Like, who would have thought? Not me. <laughs> <sighs> okay, in closing, uh, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate you all joining us uh, each and every week. Uh, we wouldn't uh, obviously be here if it wasn't for you. So, Andy, where can we find more of your work on the internet? More of my work on the internet can be found on Twitter and Instagram as at SDCC Wacky Wags. Carrie, I know last night you said just check the blog, Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Any don't, change? Don't tweet me. <laughs> just tweet the blog. Like, I, so, log into so, my personal, I log into my personal Twitter at like 11 p.m. every night for like 10 minutes. Like, don't tweet me. <laughs> and if you do, expect an answer sometime around August or September. At 11 p.m. the next night is what I will answer you. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm on the blog, Twitter. James, where can we find more of your work on the internet? You can find me all over the internet at Dan Regal. Uh, and I actually will most likely be posting more Instagrams and tweets from Galaxy's Edge tomorrow because that's about the only thing I seem to want to tweet about. So there you go. Uh, so it will be yeah. Star Wars Talk with James live? Uh, actually, I might. My uh, Beth did an Instagram live uh, when we were there on last Saturday. I might do an Instagram live tomorrow. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. If you go live, I'm going to watch. Telling you, hashtag Star Wars Talk with James. Star Wars Talk with James. We are on iTunes. If you would like to subscribe, the links are up on the blog, or you can search for SD Concast. If you like what you've heard so far, please review us. We are also on Stitcher Radio. The link is in the show notes. And I forgot to mention, uh, I didn't mention her, but uh, thank you, no. Beth, our producer, who edits the show, creates all those slides, and all the other little things that get this podcast done. Uh, if you want to get a hold of us, you can send us an email at sdcomiccon.blog at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash sdconblog or tweet us at sd underscore comic underscore con. Thank you all so much for listening. Everybody, go, go shwarma. Shwarma. <laughs> Star Wars Dr. James coming next year. <laughs>